Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as it has been mentioned, orthopedic surgery is fraught with a lot of dangers, which can happen on table or which may be discovered after the surgery is done in a post-op X-ray. And then you say, oh shit, what I have done or what has happened? Usually it is what has happened. We never say what I have done because that is a incriminating ourselves. So these are the cases which the faculty has been kind enough to just tell you exactly what happened on table, how did they come out of it, or if anything went wrong, what was done about it in the long run. So let me invite my faculty, Dr. Archik, Dr. Girish Devunani, uh, Dr. Londe, Dr. Guruvaradi is not here, and Dr. Ashit Shah. So without wasting any time, can I invite uh, Dr. Archik to start with the first case. Good afternoon. So I am going to present my oh shit moment. So this guy uh, was a 52-year-old male fruit vendor and had a THR done 19 years ago in a public hospital. Uh, had problems and was advised a revision surgery five years before he came to me. No comorbidities and he had basically postponed the surgery for financial constraints because he was a simple fruit vendor. So this is what his x-ray looked like when he presented to me. Uh, those who are unaware or younger, this is an isoelastic hip which almost all over the world had failed. And this is what its x-ray looked like at that time. Um, I felt that I would have problems in dislocating the hip because the greater trochanter was almost touching the acetabulum. Removal of screws would be difficult. One of the screws was broken. There was proximal bone loss, so I might fracture while dislocating. And there were acetabular bone defects. To see the problems again, I am showing the x-ray again. So this is what I was anticipating um, when I saw the x-ray. I also read about how to remove the screws because this is a shell uh, designed where there are four screws in the uncemented polyethylene and there are screws in the prosthesis as well. Um, I decided how to address the proximal bone loss and kept a metal cutting bar just in case if I could not take the prosthesis out easily in this location. Um, for the preparation, I thought I had done everything well. I got the APU systems of cemented, uncemented revision, uh, cage augments, everything. I also had a distal fixing stem like Wagner in all sizes just in case. I basically kept everything ready and I thought I was doing well. Um, surprise, surprise, during the surgery all this came out within no time. I had no problem. I could dislocate easily. Everything came off well. And then the oh shit moment happened. The medial wall of the femur was just like marble and I just could not penetrated to ream it. I tried various options, uh, tried to put a guide wire under CRM, then I was going to uh, ream it with uh, flexible reamers. Just the drills would slip and then the time was getting, uh, I was just uh, wasting my time. So I then uh, measured uh, the defect or the area which the prosthesis had formed. And since it was almost 160 centimeters, I finally decided to put a Wagner stem here. Uh, I could do everything well, but the post-op x-ray looked like this and I was terribly worried about uh, the arrow part where the bone looked small and I had put the femur um, in the remodeled part of, uh, the femoral process in the remodeled part. So I was worried I kept him uh, non-weight bearing for a few weeks, then allowed partial weight bearing and kept on observing him. At three months, everything was looking good, patient had no complaints, so I started him full weight bearing. At six months, if you see that defect has disappeared and I thought I had done uh, very well. Um, so I got an opportunity like this to present this in a forum and I presented and I got blasted badly because I was told this will fail because the prosthesis is put in a virus situation and I should have actually done an extended trochanteric osteotomy, used the burr, formed uh, the proper medullary canal and used a longer Wagner. I did not realize who blasted me and to my horror, the guy who blasted me to was none other than Wagner Jr. himself. So I was depressed and the other oh shit moment happened. So I said, let's follow up. So I have been following this patient and now I have a uh, follow up of six years, which is pre-COVID actually, so it's eight years. And this is how he walks. Unfortunately, has ankle arthritis and peripheral vascular disease, if you see his foot. Um, he has got now good movements at the hip, has uh, no complaints, whatever. And this is his uh, X-ray AP and lateral, everything looks fine. So the take home message is that we 
typically get distracted by what looks obvious on the x-ray. I was so concerned about dislocation and the screw removal, I never imagined that I would have a problem in opening the medullary canal. And if I had properly planned better, I would have done better, I wouldn't have wasted time. Of course, the tongue-in-cheek comment is that if you want to present such cases, make sure that who is sitting in the audience, um, you, you know beforehand that there are not senior people like that. But the most important uh, take-home message is that when you do difficult cases, don't present them unless you have a follow-up of at least six to seven years. Because every time you follow up, uh, you learn more. I think that's, that's my case. Any questions? One question. If you go back and do the surgery again, what would you do differently? I, I think I would have probably done a proper extended trochanteric osteotomy, uh, got a proper medullary canal and then put a proper process in, the, in that medullary canal rather than putting it in the remodeled bone, which I finally did it because I was running out of time and ideas that time. Uh, actually, that's, right, that's quite right. If the femur has made a false passage because of osteolysis, the cement beyond the femur, them, then we have to make a, at least a window in that area to take the cement out. Yeah. Otherwise, this can happen again and again. Uh, luckily, this was not cemented, yeah. so I, yeah. <laughs> it, it would have been easier if I had done that. Yeah. Uh, Harish, this was a, can I? Yeah, yeah, please, doctor. These are the processes where there is a virus remodeling at the tip, which are very sclerotic. It is impossible to negotiate with your drill and guide wires. The safest way, because we have done, we have brought this implant, I know, all often, you know. And we have a Bombay large experience. implant. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was uh, done first yeah. time in Bombay Hospital. Yeah, yeah. We did about 237 cases. That's why I can tell you. Uh, Any anyway, other on the tip, you make a small window, take a high speed burr, and burr out that area, and then pass the guide wire. That's the easiest way to uh, check this yeah. implant. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pachore. Can I invite Dr. Girish Devunani with his oh shit moment? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if, if you thought that Dr. Archik's moment was, oh shit, this classifies as OF, okay? We'll keep it a little mild. Uh, and I've changed the topic, uh, as you see in your brochure, it was those who forget history are doomed to fail. I think it's condemned. So let's see what we have. So this uh, young lady, 64 years to be precise, presented to me with a bilateral hip AVN. Left, obviously, as seen on the X-ray, was more painful. Uh, so I embarked on what I normally do for the last 15 years is an uncemented uh, uh, system, pinnacle corel, and I used the direct lateral or the hardened approach. Everything seemed pretty fine on table. Turned the patient on her back. The link blends were equal. The stability was fine on table, till the patient was shifted to the ward and the ward doctor calls me up exactly two hours after uh, the patient was shifted that, sir, she's got a shortening of that limb and uh, complaining of a lot of pain, which I, as you all know is a little unexpected in hips. So fearing the worst, I thought probably she's dislocated in the ward while transferring or whatever. As Harish said, you always blame somebody else. So, we said, get an x-ray done. And this was what had happened. So, as you see here, she has sustained a fracture of the calcar. Now, I was pretty sure that I had not noticed any cracks when I was preparing the canal. But, you know, sometimes you feel that you're doubting yourself. The gentleman who was assisting me was adamant that we had not had any false uh, sort of cracks there. But be as it may, this is the situation. You are three hours post-operative, and when you have to go and break this news to the patient that you're going to require another operation, it's not exactly very pleasant. So, so what do we think happened here? My feeling was, okay, probably there was a crack which I did not notice and that just propagated while the patient was shifted. Was there any way of preventing this? Uh, besides saying that I should be more careful, I couldn't find any answers to it. What were my available options? Of course, we were clear that we had to go down and revise this. I did uh, have a chat with the patient trying to take them into confidence as much as possible. I did speak to a couple of my senior colleagues, 
both of whom happened to be in the hall at the moment and both felt that yeah there was no other option but to revise so 48 hours later we took her back to the OR uh, the stem I expected walked out into my hand I wired the fracture back in this normal position and then put in a distal fixing uh, long stem and all seemed very fine and we started mobilizing her albeit a little slowly uh, because of the double surgery praying very hard that she does not get infected because that is the biggest risk factor well got away with it and for two years she was fantastically fine before she came back to me for the second side now in the interim she had sustained a spinal injury had been operated by the spinal surgeons sent elsewhere the spinal team had put her on uh, osteoporotic treatment uh, and she was on Terry Perrin already 12 months down the line when she presented for the second side to be operated because the left side she was ecstatic with it she was extremely comfortable no pain and thought I was the best surgeon in the world so we went ahead and did the second surgery this time being extremely extremely careful that there should not be any obvious cracks etc and the post-op x-ray thankfully did not show anything abnormal I started mobilizing her partial weight bearing with a walker but at seven days the family calls me and says sir something has happened she has not had a fall but she just has gone off her legs and this was on the right side so this is an exact carbon copy of what happened on the left side this is now seven days post-operative seven days she has been walking with a walker so it was same it different day and the same thing was done for her both uh, the stem uh, distal fixing stem uh, used after removing the old stem so she is now nearly four to five years post-operative she has had ongoing osteoporosis treatment and as I said, luckily no complaints and she claims that uh, there was no, no one better than me. So my questions to this audience are, what happened here and why? I'm still not sure. Going through literature, there are some reports of the Korai having uh, incidence of calcar fractures, especially in proximal femur, femur geometries, which may not be absolutely uh, sort of suitable for it. Any prediction markers? Yes, you could argue that I should have done something different, anticipating the first side was gone, had gone wrong. The last line is very important. Patient counseling and rapport is something which I need to emphasize to everybody here. She came back to me for all her four surgeries. That is important so that the patient does not feel that you are not being, you know, receptive to her complaints, not being rude, and can develop a working rapport with her. And I leave you with this last question. Does an uncemented femoral system in an osteopenic or porotic bone, is it a risk worth taking? Thank you very much. Any questions? Hi, Girish. Uh, we've noticed the same thing with coral in Indian females where the canals are narrower. You try to sink it in, else you risk a lengthening of the uh, uh, limb. So, uh, and you try to force it in to get it down uh, below the neck, you know, your cut where you've taken. And we've also experienced the same thing. So, what had happened to prevent this, we had to lengthen the uh, limb, you know. We use the same coral uncemented stem. So, I feel going to cemented stems when using coral is especially helpful. So, so you, you, Harish, can I? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, one important message of the coral is that this is no taper the taper is very minimal it is not like type 2 so it is a flat prosthesis and immediately it is uh, you have seen it is almost like a quad, uh, quadrangle type like a joy muller so the chance of fracture with this stems are extremely high so one has to be slightly careful number one number two the vertical offset of coral is slightly higher uh, compared to other implants and especially for India that's why you get a lot of lengthening and you want to reduce that lengthening, you want to hammer that inside and that was does. For osteoporotic bone, I think prophylactic wiring, if you want to use this implant, put a prophylactic wiring. And another important message, any small crack looking at the, at the level of the calcar, please follow that till the end of that fracture. 
that is the common mistake done by most surgeons and get the wire right distally at the at the level of the where the fracture ends that is important message so i take yes. your point about the about the crack but uh, if we take a poll of all pe of all people attending this conference most of us use the corai stem and have had excellent results am i wrong in saying that dr harish yeah girish can i just ask you one question if you had experience of intra op fracture in a patient in osteoporotic patient then a spine surgeon has fractured spine because of porotic bones why did you try to do non cement in the third case wouldn't you have been safer to do cement uh, uh, sir i once arish the question is the spine surgeon put her on she had a traumatic injury causing a fractured spine and they operated on her and to protect and they put her on a teriparatide therapy she already had had one year of teriparatide so yes that's something which i want to convey that maybe i should have thought about a cemented stem but again multiple people out here would prefer to do an uncemented bipolar in an 85 year old neck femur because they don't believe they do, they feel the cement is a risk factor anybody out there have, have happy to put their hands up and say we only do uncemented stems and shaker so i think uh, you should have chosen a stem of a different profile Yeah, high profile, uh, uh, proximal loading. Uh, Dana Shekhar, probably my my learning from this is if I should have taken the long stem from day one. Not a long stem, probably a high profile stem like a summit or a energy type of stem, which has a broader profile in yeah, the proximal pro femur, which will allow you to get a fixation with minimal impaction, rather than trying to get a wedge inside. Probably, right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Girish. Now uh, we'll invite uh, Dr. Harish Bende, who is also a convener, presenting his case. A lot of the time on surgery, you try to be technically correct, but that doesn't guarantee that the things will go right on table. Uh, this was a patient, rheumatoid or arthritis again, 30 degree flexion deformity, not able to walk for a long time. The bones were very osteoporotic, 56 year old, not very old, female patient. So when we had wanted to do TKR in this patient because of severe pain, we had planned in our mind that the patient with a severe FFD, we would rather take a little distra external femoral cut, and up to four millimeter cut is acceptable. That much amount of raised joint line normally doesn't matter, so that we can increase the extension gap. Then there is a flexion extension mismatch in a patient with a significant FFD. So we have to use usually upsize femoral component. So we also had planned to go upsize in a femoral component so that we can balance the flexion gap excess which is there after you have done the posterior release. And the patella tracking is not sometimes very good in this patient so we wanted to slightly lateralize the femoral implant which we normally do in many patients to improve the patella tracking so that the Q angle is reduced. All three things technically right and we thought I will do well during surgery. But on table, when we started the case, we did the primary cut, did everything, put a trial component, and when I was trying to reduce the trial component, I found a small crack, and then I realized my lateral condyle has just cracked open. So at that point of time, I had no other option. I had to reduce it back, put the K wires, stabilize it, then put a buttress plate with the recon plate on uh, outer side, keeping the two uh, K wires inside. We cemented the femur in. and this was a post op x ray of that patient ideally i should have used a long stem on the femoral so as to offset that fractured area but uh, this particular system which was called ps150 didn't have a femur which has got a long stem and i didn't have another system which is called tc3 which can use a long stem because it's a revision system so we hadn't kept anything ready on this table so then we just thought that is what i could do maximum we kept the patient in brace for almost 6 weeks we mobilized her very gently eventually it healed patient had a good function she become quite well the question was what went wrong it is very easy to say that oh i couldn't help it the bone was too bad anyway it would have happened in anybody's hand but if you analyze exactly what went wrong on table this was a patient with ra ffd and this would have been my ideally normal cut of a distal femur i had and that much is a gap between the box and the lateral edge of the cortex but when i take a extra distal femoral cut my box becomes much more proximal the gap between the edge of a box and lateral part become narrow 
then i want to upsize my component the box become bigger that gap becomes still narrower and i have lateralized it that becomes still further narrower so now i have got a very narrow bridge of a bone on the outer side of my implant between the edge of a box and the edge of a lateral condylar uh, articular surface and then when i use a box cut the box cut in this particular system doesn't have a protected cutting mechanism ideally one should use a sagittal oscillating saw we never have that many of the thing i don't have it in my system i use it only for unique compartment only but normally we just take saw and put a box cut there and very easily that saw can easily penetrate beyond the depth of a cut and can easily cut the posterior cortex up to almost the cortex so here is the recipe of a disaster because sequential things which are done technically may be right to correct my flexion deformity has cumulatively added to a very narrow gap laterally and cause a fracture so it may look good on table message is you have to be careful with your saw number 1 you have to analyze effect of extra cuts or extra component sizing or changing your uh, sizing during on the table you have to be careful about hammering while setting the trial and actual component a gentle hammer is what is required and dislocating the trial component you have to be sure that you have got adequate push and then dislocate it gently because i have i had similar experience at least 3 times before and all the three times i could get away with the plate which was done but again it is a dislocation of a trial component is at point at which it happens so you have to be very careful when you dislocate this hip because tissues are sometimes very tight they are actually stronger the fibrous tissue are stronger than the actual quality of bone so you have to be careful thank you any questions usually when you are correcting a fixed flexion deformity always there is a risk of a fracture yeah like the supracondylar area or the condyles can get avulsed yeah uh, do you think we should have a stem backup for all these absolutely cases? with all these experience we yeah. should have at least a component which are stemable yes. like this system ps150 did not have a, a no, system no, no. which has, which can put stem on it so we should uh, uh, you know refrain from using such system always a good idea to cover stem on this table definitely yeah. yes sir uh, when i am putting the trial component or the actual femur i never mm. use the impactor i use it uh, with the hand with the hand yeah so your comments on this yeah we should use it with the hand and if your cuts are right it should go with the hand and you gently tap not hammer when you say i hammer it in the Just meaning mallet. by mind is different the tapping is different harish so okay. basically here when you remove the implant that's the time the fracture happened remove that com uh, trial uh, component trial yeah. component would it be in this kind of cases where it is so much of osteoporosis once you are happy with general alignment would you not put the final femur final tibia and then put a trial component and trial poly and see your balance do whatever release you have to do and then remove the insert which is the trial one and put the final one that will prevent that step of femur coming back would you be comfortable doing that I, in this kind of cases i am not comfortable using cementing the component unless i have done at least one trial with the minimum thickness of a implant a uh, thickness of a insert the second thing is i have a case where the similar thing happened on third day of the operation this happened on table it is still good we can correct it but it happened on the third or fourth day then it is a mess so i should what would happen if you so, this happened when you cemented the implant and then hammered it in then this happens then what see the question here is in this particular case uh, very categorically it happens even it has happened to me also when you try to remove the femoral component and all the addition of what harish just mentioned that why did it happen it can fracture the lateral condyle so just to prevent that maneuver of putting the trial removing the trial you put a final implant because you're not going to change the size of 2.5 or 3 femur whatever you have selected then it's a question of getting your soft tissue balancing right which you can do with your final femur cemented in final tibia cemented in all that you have to do is the poly if you put a 8 poly or 9 whichever this implant was and you feel there is some problem you do the soft tissue release and again put your higher poly and you get the balance right and put the final poly so that that maneuver will stop you know of removing the femur and putting it back so can i just play the devil's advocate again why do a trial reduction at all in any any because some very high volume groups just do a cement uh, just do a spacer estimate the poly 10 jayega ha theek hai components 
this is for this particular case where you see so much of osteoporosis so much of deformity correction has been done femur has been resected 4 mm extra and cumulative effect of all those 3 or 4 steps puts your lateral condyle at a risk of fracturing so but not uh, for the standard cases when you are already put your cemented components in and you have a fixed flexion deformity how are you going to correct it so you are going to force it then again you have a supracondylar fracture he has already corrected all that you know mm. he's got that right that okay so you cannot get a full uh, okay. you know balance uh, Ashit, unless, Ashit, unless let's get trial. some question so, from yeah. the what's floor. the what's yeah. the take the on the stress riser caused Two by minutes, multi, yeah. stress riser caused by the multiple pins for securing the cutting zig that yeah, also can be cause of fracture but this actually happened from the age of a box but that can also cause fracture yes the sometimes sometimes even yeah uh, dr elans yeah, so uh, basic problem happened that you are dealing with the rheumatoid knee osteopenic bone you want to do a ps because you the quality of the uh, pcl is not to be relied on for a cr and it's an absolute contraindication would any of the panel consider an ultra congruent knee you sacrifice the pcl but you have an anti stabilized knee if you want to avoid the takes box takes away yes. the problems of the box if you want to avoid the box, yes, we can use ultra congruent. That is another option. The box yeah. won't be there. Very small. So you have an easier yeah. division. You have walking mm -hmm. on osteopenic bone. Yeah. It is a very logical solution. That so, can be done. So there is no contraindication of doing a CR knee uh, in uh, rheumatoid patients because there is no proof, no evidence that the PCL will contract or quality of PCL is bad in a rheumatoid knee. So there are good number of CR surgeons in our country. A lot of people have been doing it and there is international publications on that, that CR, the posterior cruciate ligament, the quality is not bad. So as far as you get the balance right, your gaps right and medically the rheumatoid is controlled, there won't be any problem to the PCR. The question I was would you consider an ultra yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah. Then is there any role of preoperative CT scan? You see the cyst and sometimes the cyst. On the uh, you can take CT scan, but that was not a cause. I mean, when you do the cuts, you can actually see the cyst. The cyst if it is there, yeah. it opens up. You can see there is a huge bony cavity, and then you are doubly careful about that. So I wouldn't take routine CT scan. I think yes. we should call the so, next. Yeah. Sometimes the uh, one last comment. There are two other reasons. Could be sometimes incomplete bone saw cuts, which could then you are putting the trial that that could have propagated the this uh, defect. And sometimes the mismatch, you have taken the trial for size 4 and somehow the assistant given a different trial, yeah. this thing. That, this are that, that, that can happen, but that wasn't the case. Anyway, can I invite the uh, next speaker? Sanjay. Before, before Sanjay starts, my, my little learning from Harish's case is that whenever you're doing a TKR, please have trauma implants available on standby. Because many people operate in smaller nursing homes where you only ask for a joint replacement system. And when you have something like this, then you're waiting for an hour and a half to get the trauma implants in, get them autoclaved and then use them and then risking the risk of infection. So whenever you're doing a joint replacement, make sure your back, table, back end has got at least basic trauma implants, plates and screws. Thanks. Yeah. Sanjay, can you proceed? Yeah. So, continuing this series of O-shit movements, we had this our O-shit movement almost about uh, five weeks back. 81-year-old patient who complained of pain in both the knees, uh, routine straightforward case, getting uh, pain on walking and uh, affecting the normal activities of daily living. Right uh, pain was more than the left. His peripheral pulses were feeble. He had uh, uh, hypertension and diabetes and they were feeble and he was 81 so we de decided preoperatively that uh, we will not be using a tourniquet. So this was his uh, preoperative x-ray, uh, standing AP and uh, this was his lateral x-ray. Uh, in fact, uh, we operate as a team and uh, this case was one of my colleagues but we operate, uh, always help each other, you know. So the case gets induced in one of the topmost hospitals in uh, Mumbai tourniquet was not used and we do a vertical midline incision, standard medial arthrotomy uh, and then the O-shit movement happens within 10 minutes of opening the joint. This is what we found. There was complete vertical split in the medial femoral condyle. Again, I will show you the x-ray. This x-ray was done about two and a half weeks before the operation 
and unfortunately majority of us our patients get admitted the previous evening we usually don't go and see the patients at least i don't maybe some of the panelists might be going and seeing the patients the previous night so this x-ray was done two and a half weeks back patient is posted for a routine elective right total knee replacement unilateral without a tourniquet this is the movement unfortunately it is still a tertiary care hospital but during during the operation uh, there is no inventory there is no locking plate there is no tumor prosthesis so i think can i can i just interrupt it here and take a opinion of the panelist dr harish how would you how would you proceed now first of all let us see how long is that fracture is it extending proximally into the shaft it is extending proximally is into the shaft it is just a condyle which has come no, off no it is extending into the shaft as you can see there is a spike going into the upper part if it is extending in the shaft you have to open it proximally and ideally you should fix it let the fracture heal and then wait for maybe 6 months and then go ahead with the tkr which would be a much simpler option rather than trying to do tkr now with a fracture inside because in this patient will be a you know you are unnecessary increase the complication dr raja what so if you have don't have a fixation option on table you cannot fix and replace yeah you because see typically it will take about uh, busy hours of mumbai 9:30 in the morning the plate will arrive after about 1 hour another half an hour of autoclaving i think best thing is to go and fix with screws and uh, immobilize and then come out once the fracture heals you can go back and take care later 81 year old so you don't have any other inventory on table so yes yes oh shit means this is yeah, the oh shit yeah. moment you know? <laughs> or you can you can just close it and come out get the all the inventory ready and go back and do it in a single sitting Ashit, all together i think so this is the fracture that needs to be treated first if you don't have the mega process and you know obviously to do a mega process is in otherwise an osteoarthritic patient who was walking was he walking when he came on the admission yes i'll come to that he was walking who were walking about so two and a half two weeks before the no 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 on the day of admission though you don't go but at least tell your registrar or someone to see whether the patient nobody is saw him walking ah, he had that's that's the problem that's something nobody that, saw him the walking that's something that we have to see that all the patients severe deformity severe arthritis they have to walk in front of you that's what i make sure that they walk in front before of before the operation before the surgery so anyway now this situation i would probably do exactly what harish has said fix the fracture let the fracture heal and then tkr would be a subsequent later on uh, next quickly well i first said you should have some trauma implants if you don't have then at dhanushekar said live to fight another day close come out and then plan the planning could be either surgery or mega processes depending on what your thinking pattern is but if i was dealing with an 81 year old then probably mega processes would be an option because i would get the patient up up and going soon dr archik quickly i would agree with harish i would fix the fracture and do a tkr later on probably 6 months down the line rather than using any mega yeah. process so we follow sunil the, can you go ahead yeah. yeah we followed dr raja and dr devnani uh, we ate a humble pie and we closed the wound just temporarily fixed with the k wires so these are the disadvantage of fixing with the plate non availability of the plate patient has to remain non weight bearing till the fracture unites then another surgery of plate removal and uh, tkr Uh, mega prosthesis advantage is basically only one surgery disadvantage obviously we had no mega prosthesis on table so we temporarily fixed it this was the on sort of table whatever sort of uh, not a stable fixation but at least some fixation this is the immediate post of x-ray we went back to the family explained exactly what has happened counseled them properly and we made a conscious decision keeping them in the loop to go ahead with the mega prosthesis now again arranging a mega prosthesis is a big task fortunately within two or three days the mega prosthesis arrived in city of mumbai from somewhere else i think it was chennai or uh, somewhere uh, it was parked so we went in and uh, we implanted a mega prosthesis this is the intraop uh, picture this is the uh, this is the actual prosthesis which has been put in we put the striker system of the mega prosthesis this is immediate post op x ray it's about we did about 5 weeks back so again uh, uh, if the story doesn't end here as one can it uh, means it never rains you know it pours the patient had a persistent serous discharge on the second or third day so again we take him to the theater on fourth day we gave a good wash secondary suturing fortunately the wound healed and the patient is doing well from that point 
Now, if you really look at the pre primary x-ray, you know, there was some suspicion there. And on close inquiry, when we went back to the patient's relation, they mentioned that patient had sudden increased pain in the right knee about three days prior to the admission to the hospital. I think Ashit is absolutely bang on. So probably he might have had a stress fracture three days back and there was no evidence that the patient was walking in the last predis the, the previous three days. So probably he already had a fracture. The x-ray was two and a half weeks back. So I don't know, means uh, we should have got in the x-ray on the same night, the previous night of the operation or we should have got in a CT scan uh, if to, be, to make it doubly sure. Okay, any question? We have just time for one question because we have one more case to come. Anybody from the floor? Dhan Shekhar? I think uh, uh, this EPL stress fractures are very common. Patient come and consult you with severe virus deformity. They fix an appointment after two weeks. After two weeks, they come back with the stress fractures. Very often happened uh, in our practice. Immediately on admission, we need to see the patient again, see where is the pain exactly, whether there's a new onset pain in the down the metaphysis, get a new x-ray done. So that's how we avoid this situation. Re-examining the patient just before uh, surgery is very important. Yes, tibial fracture is very common. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. Let me invite Dr. Ashit Shah. He has another case. So, good evening friends. Uh, thank you Vairoc2022 uh, for this opportunity. Moving from big joints, hip joints and knee joints to partial knee replacement, uni can be treacherous. So, we have this 79 year old lady, had left knee pain since one year and she exhausted all her conservative measures of uh, treatment. Pain was affecting her ADLs and was clinically and radiologically meeting the criteria to undergo UKR. Standard, uh, no other medical mor mor morbidities, so we went ahead and did this uh, partial knee, medial partial knee fixed bearing implant. Post-operatively, this is the x-ray that was found. She had pain on the next day, I get the x-ray next day, out of the proportion than what you expect at 24 hours post-op. If you see very carefully here, the implants are small, bones are small, you have to see that the posterior cortex of the tibia is blown and the tibial implant has migrated posteriorly. This was not picked up intraoperatively. This was on the first post-op x-ray, first post-op day in February 2021. And that is where it was, oh shit, next day, patient is, you know, you are about to make the patient walk and patient got severe pain, can't walk. However, 81, and this was the problem, they did not agree. And even I was convinced that, you know, if we keep the patient non-weight bearing, she might just settle down. So we kept her non-weight bearing for about three or four weeks. That's when the second wave of the epidemic hurt, you know, it uh, was there, that is February, March uh, last year. And subsequently, if you see March and May x-ray, the implant has migrated and the proximal tibia has sunk. So May 2021, end of the second wave, probably the patient came back that now, sir, do something about this. And this is what was done. The options I had was proximal tibial osteotomy and fixation. In a 79-year-old lady who has already suffered for three months non-weight bearing, that probably was not the right choice. So thought about doing a revision uh, to total knee replacement. After exposure and implant removal, this is what was seen. This is the standard as we see when we remove the uh, implants. However, on the tibia, the artery clip that I have put shows that posteriorly there is no bone left between the posterior slot of the uni and the posterior cortex of the tibial medial condyle. We had to do this uh, uh, revision prosthesis, which is again a stacked implant on the medial side, which is a fairly straightforward exercise for most of our arthroplasty surgeons with a good flexion and extension. And this was cruciate retaining primary femur stem tibia with augments, size A femur, size 1 tibia, and 11 millimeter CR poly. So that is fine. So what actually went wrong on the first day of surgery? I think so the tibia was too small, size 1 tibia is what we have used in the final implants. Final tibial preparation reciprocating saw cut weakened the tibial cortex and minimal bone was left between the tibial slot and the cortex. So now how do I check it? Once we put this fixed bearing tibial trial implant, I get my hook inside and make sure that the hook goes beyond the tibial trial plate and it can feel the bone beyond. Secondly, the saw which makes the reciprocating saw which makes the slot, the orientation has to be correct. 
The picture on the left is the correct orientation. Picture in the center is the wrong orientation because the saw is lifted up. It will make a perforation in the posterior cortex. The picture on the extreme right shows the red line is where you should actually have the slot and what happened in my case is what is shown in the bottom, the, the break went all the way posteriorly and blew the cortex posteriorly. So this is how I do it now, once the slot is prepared, I put my hook, this is a normal bone and this is going beyond the tibia into the soft tissue and this is what I make sure now with this hook which sees that the slot is prepared properly and there is enough bone posteriorly. So, oh shit movements in UKR surgery especially will happen due to tibial fractures, either too deep a tibial resection as we can see in the picture here, multiple pinholes in tibia can be a stress riser, posterior cortical blowout as we saw in this case and final impaction of implants. Be careful because here the bone surface is small, implants are smaller, we are used to hammering our hips and knees but this is where you should just gently probably just push it with uh, your hand. So take home message is tibial cut must be perfect, it should be about 4 mm deep from the anteromedial defect on the tibia. Tibial preparation with care because sizing and positioning of the implant is very very important here, you don't have much liberty of slightly lateralizing the implant, you are absolutely tight packed for the space. Reciprocating saw parallel to the tibial base plate as I showed in the picture and not to lift the hand and final implant impaction with soft tapping and not heavy hammering. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the floor? One question from me, uh, Ashit. If you have such a small bone, why not to do TKR primarily because it's a safer implant than try to do a uni? uni. I know, I mean, there is always debate with uni and total, but in right. this particular situation. So this we realized later on when I opened up for the second, second time. Uh, Primary UKR had gone very, very smoothly without any problems. It's only that I did not realize that I have perforated the posterior cortex in one of those steps that I mentioned. So there was never a problem of sizing of the implant on the first go. So overall, if you see uni versus TKR, the rehabilitation is much faster, especially in the elderly patient. No, no, no. I am not going into discussion that, between yeah. uni and TKR. In yeah. this patient, if you are using the smallest bone, like you use size, size 1 femur, right? Yeah. So it is the smallest femur you can get and this was a uh, system uh, from this Merrill. Is, no, no, this is from, no, this is the, the partial knee revision. was from Johnson and the revision is from Merrill. Yeah, so Merrill size 1 is one of the smallest, smallest. size 1 implant you can get in India. Correct. Correct. Smaller than that is not available not in Merrill. Correct. So, the so that uni means the bone is very small correct. in such a small one because all these other International implants are designed for a Caucasian bone, Correct. which are usually bigger. We come get problem with the small, tiny ladies, where we may not get the smallest also adequately, you know, small enough. So this idea so I why got not go for TKR when I revised. When I revised. So when I did the primary surgery, it went very smoothly with the standard size one femur, one tibia of uh, Johnson and Johnson fixed bearing. So there was not a problem. And The integrity of the posterior cortex is very important. In People trace survival. So make sure that you check the posterior cortex is intact. Correct. Doesn't matter what size you are using. You know, a big uh, tibial tray, if you yeah. reach the posterior cortex, is going to fail. So that's the take home point with this. Anup. Uh, Anup. Yeah. Uh, so some of these problems can be eliminated by use of robotics, yeah. which is very useful in uni because you don't use a recip saw. You resect minimum of tibia because most of the adjustments you can do on the femur. Correct. So I think you, for unis at least robotics is the way to go. Absolutely. Point well taken. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we have just finished your time within. I thank all the faculty. Can you please come here for a photo all together?